Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So today we'll do the six steps for knowing God's will for my life, for your life. And on top of that, I'll give you bonus for only $19.99. <laughs> we'll have the bonus, they'll be free as well, because we as humans, we like to make things more complicated. You could probably break this down to three steps, maybe two. But we need to dumb things down enough to put them into simple steps. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, who here has God's will for their life all worked out? Raise your hand. We have young men here, young women, early on in their life. We have middle-aged people living our lives. We have people who are beyond 50% of their life. We're all living our lives, and are we living our lives according to the will of God? This is an important question we should be asking. Are we just waking up every morning, fall out of bed, brush your teeth, comb your hair, you go to your job, you do your work, you come on back, everything's over, you go to bed, you pray a prayer, God be with me, forgive my sins, you go to bed, you wake up the next day. Is that how we're living our lives? Many times I feel that's how I live my life. Just, it's just a cycle. And then before you know it, 70% of your life is over, and then you wonder, well, have I been living according to God's will? Very important questions for us to ask ourselves. Our key text we've already gone over. The Lord wants to teach us His paths and lead us in truth. I'd like to introduce you to somebody. I'm not sure if everyone knows this person. Has anyone heard of George Mueller? So many of you, maybe you have stories that you could add to what I have. Maybe some of you uh, need to learn more about him, more than what I'll talk about him today. I would recommend you go to georgemuller.org, maybe this, set, this Sabbath or tomorrow or sometime this week, and just read a little bit about this gentleman. He was born in 1805. He lived to 1898. Um, he is one of the great men of Christianity, of spirituality, uh, and I was very impressed with his story. Originally, he was German. He was born in Germany, and in 1835, he moved to Bristol, England. Now, in Bristol, England, and all of the world in that time, there was a real problem with homeless people. But not just homeless people, orphans, homeless children. In this day and age, it's really easy. If you have somebody you don't like, a child that you don't want, it sounds horrible, but you could, A, send them up for adoption. There's adoption agencies run by the government. You can abort the child. That's done. We have aborted millions of children. So there's not much of a, of a problem of homeless children running around in the streets. In that day and age, there was not that safety net. There wasn't that practice of abortion. So you would have children in the streets, little infants with their brothers, not wanted by family, and these children would be starving. These children would have no way of work, so they would be working in sweatshops, moving heavy machinery, doing things that were dangerous. You know, we didn't have the work restrictions and safety that um, in that time that we have now. You know, so you had young children doing very dangerous jobs. They were discardable. They were not wanted by anyone in society. So George moved to Bristol, England. It, like many cities in that time, had this problem. Children were everywhere. And um, he, he started as a pastor there, and that's where he really started to grow in his faith um, with God. He had the practice of having a little, uh, a little uh, offering plate at the back of the church. He would never beg for funds. Have you been to churches that beg for funds? Mm -hmm. We need funds. Give us. Fill us up. Help, help us pay off our, our loan on our church. Help us do this. Help us do that. They're, they're always begging. Everybody's begging for money. He never begged. He never asked. And that's how he developed in his spiritual life with God. While he was there in Bristol, England, he was touched by the verse in James 1.27, and it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. When he read to visit the fatherless and the widows, that's what really touched him. You know, there needs to be something done about the children here um, in Bristol, England. So what did he do about it? This is a picture of 1,500 boys and girls in 1805, and they're outside of one of his orphanages. 
In fact, he didn't just build one orphanage, he had up to five orphan houses that he had developed. In his lifetime, George Mueller raised over 10,000 orphans. He benefited over 60,000 children in his life. One house was big enough to house over 2,000 children at one time. How much money did all this cost? It's estimated that it cost over $7 million for George Mueller to run this operation. Did George Mueller have a job? Was somebody paying him? Nobody was paying him. Was he begging for money out of the back of the church? Never begged. He attributed all of this success to the fact that he asked God for every penny, and he was never in want. So I asked the congregation today, how much money are you making? What does the average American make net in his, whole, his or her whole life, working to 65, working long hours, full time? How much money do you make? So I don't want to go into the gender disparities to pay. I just got this off the internet. It's from the U.S. Census Bureau income data. It is the net money someone will make from 35 to 65, and it's broken down by high school, associate's degrees, bachelor's degree, or higher. If you go to get a bachelor's degree, the average male will make around 2.1 million by the time he's 65. Now this is before Uncle Sam takes everything, the costs of living, and all that stuff. This is just what you make. The average women, woman, 1.4 million. And you can understand, you know, we can get into all the, the drama of that, but I'm going to avoid that today. If you have an associate's degree, the average is around 1.2, and if you have just high school alone, 0.7 million in a whole lifetime. So my question for us is, why are we working? We should be praying. George Mueller made $7 million to raise all these children. $7 million in that day and age. And here, Americans are working all their lives, and they don't even make half of what he made. Here's a, a quick story on, on a common story in the theme in the life of, of George Mueller. So it was a common thing for them to always be running out of money, running out of food. <laughs> but they had complete reliance on God. So one day, uh, George Mueller was in one of his houses. Uh, I think it was more early on before he had five of them. And he and his wife knew that they had no more money. They had no more food to feed the children. They didn't have anything to give them to drink. And it was breakfast time. So he lined all of his children up in a row in the kitchen, and um, he, he, he told them, you know what, children, we must not be late for school. You know, we're going to pray to God now. And he prayed. He said, Father, he raised his hands and said, Father, thank thee for what thou art about to give us to eat. And the second he finished his prayer, there was a knock at the door. What had happened? The local baker had gotten an impression from God last evening that he should bathe all night and make bread for those children. Amen. And that was not it. Just as soon as the baker unloaded all the bread that he made for the children, there was another knock at the door. And it was the milkman. The milkman, his, his car, his, his wagon broke down right in front of the Mueller orphanage. And he needed to get it fixed. And he had to unload all the milk so he could take his vehicle to get fixed. So he gave all the milk to George Mueller. And this was a common story. This is how he lived his life. This is how George Mueller raised 10,000 children. Interesting thing about how he raised his children. This man was meticulous. Like I said, remember the whole thing about you wake up, you go to bed, you wake up, you go to bed, you have this cycle, and you're just living your life. How does George Mueller live his life? He, would, he recorded the exact date he got each child, why they were there, what their history was, he recorded the date that they left. Maybe they got married. They were old enough to move out on their own. Um, maybe they got adopted. And then he also recorded if they had become a Christian or not. He, it was a very important thing. And he, he, if you go to Bristol, England, there's supposedly a museum, you can go see his meticulous notes. He would write for some children like, yes, he, he's a Christian or born again. There's this little part where he said not. 
So it was something that was very important for all those children he cared for. He cared like they were his own children. Very meticulous gentleman. Quote from George Mueller, October 1st, when I had not one penny in hand for the needs of this day, ten shillings were brought to me for the orphans. The enclosed note read, Your Heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Trust in the Lord. This word of our Lord is to be more valuable than many bank notes. Like I said, very meticulous. What did George Mueller do? He chronicled every prayer he made. How many of you chronicle your prayers? How many of you just say the same prayer over and over again? Oh, you know, forgive me my sins, make me more like you. Good night. The next, set, the next, next night it's the same prayer. Forgive me my sins, make me more like you. Good night. What kind of prayer is that? This. 50,000 prayers he chronicled as being answered that he made to the Lord. 30,000 of these prayers were answered within 24 hours. So you think of people of this time. There's a wonderful book I recommend that everyone reads as well, The Power of Prayer Through Me Abounds. I also recommend that we review our lesson because we're all experts on prayer just from the last quarterly. There are people in this time, people in this age, Ellen White is one of the amazing stories of things that happened with the power of prayer. Founders of our church. And how do we live our lives today? This man lived a scientific life. He recorded everything. How are we living our lives today? Hours every day, but I live in the spirit of prayer. I pray as I walk, when I lie down, when I rise, and the answers are always coming. Tens of thousands of times my prayers have been answered. When once I am persuaded that a thing is right, I go on praying for it until the end comes. I never give up. So George Mueller, with this powerful prayer life, with this powerful relationship that he had developed with God, he developed six steps that have worked for him, tried in his 50,000 answered prayers, uh, that he used to understand the will of God for his life. I'm going to share those with you today, and step seven and eight have been added. How important it is to ascertain the will of God before we understand anything, we must, uh, anything, because we are then not only blessed in our own souls, but also the work of our hands will prosper. That was a man whose work prospered. He was able to bless over 60,000 children in his lifetime. Step one, have no will in the matter. He quote unquote says, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Nine-tenths of the trouble with people is generally, uh, generally just here. Have you noticed that in your life? I think this is the biggest problem for many of us is we have a will of our own. We ask God for help on something. Lord, what would you have me do? What do you want my career to be? Who should I marry? Where should I move? What should I do? And inside, deep inside our hearts, we have an answer that we kind of want. We already have a will. He says that nine-tenths of difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever that may be. When one is truly in this state, it is usually but a little way to the knowledge of what his will is. So it's, it's just there. Just there. You could say this is step number one of three. Very simple, but we're breaking it to six. Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What does this mean? What is God's plan for our life? A life of peace? A life of an expected end? So it's not like He has bad plans for us. He has good plans for us. But somehow I think that my plans for myself, they, they are better. And I just want Him to obey my will. Ellen White says in Ministry of Healing, page 479, Too many, in planning for a brilliant future, make another failure. Let God plan for you, as a little child trusts in the guidance, to the guidance of him who will keep him, who will keep the feet of his saints, 
God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led. If they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. So, what do we learn from this? God is never going to force us. But he has a plan for our life. I'm looking here, we have many young people. Think of the potential. Think of the potential that you have in this world. And many of us, we have our own brilliant idea. I have my brilliant idea of what I should do. You have yours. Those of us in our middle age, we still have brilliant ideas. But we have infinite potential if we live our lives according to God's will. <laughs> Success comes when the will is yielded to God. Every human being possessed of reason has power to choose the right. In every experience of life, God's word to us is, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Everyone may place his will on the side uh, of the will of God may choose to obey him, and thus, by linking himself to divine agencies, he may stand where nothing can force him to do evil. In every youth, every child, lies the power, by the help of God, to form a character of integrity and to live a life of usefulness. So I think this is a key part. Not my will, but thy will. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing for us to give up. Step two, what kind of decisions do we normally make? Emotional. Are we really thinking or are we feeling our way through life? You know, is, it, is it comfortable? Is it easy? Well, I'm going to go the easy way. I don't want to go the hard way. I want to slide through life. I don't want to work hard. Mr. Mueller would say, having done step one, which is leaving my will out of the picture, I do not leave the result to feeling or simple impressions. He believed that if he allowed feelings to come into his decision making, he would expose himself to grave delusions. Is it important to be free of delusions, free of confusion? Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostles, impressions alone are not a safe guide to duty. The enemy often persuades men to believe that it is God who is guiding them, when in reality they are following only human impulse. But if we watch carefully and take counsel with our brethren, we shall be given an understanding of the Lord's will, for the promise is the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. So, have you talked to those people who think they know the will of God, and they they may attribute their impulses, their emotions, to the voice of God Himself. It's very important that we are not, not confused, not liable to great delusions. Step three: study God's Word. And I think that He He said He puts us in a very interesting light. He says here, "I seek the will of the Spirit of God through or in connection with the Word of God." Then uh, George Mueller even further specified that. He said, the spirit and the word must be combined. If I look to the spirit alone without the word, I lay myself open to grave delusions also. If the Holy Ghost guides us at all, he will do it according to the scriptures and never contrary to them. What does that mean? It's kind of a loaded paragraph. Testimonies, uh, fifth testimony, page 512, Ellen White kind of goes into this. How shall we distinguish it from the voice of a false shepherd? God reveals his will to us in his word, the Holy Scriptures. His voice is also revealed in providential workings, and it will be recognized if we do not separate our souls from him by walking in our own ways, doing according to our own wills, and following the promptings of an unsanctified heart. Until the senses have become so confused that eternal things are not discerned, and the voice of Satan is so disguised that it is accepted as the will of God. Brothers and sisters, we can read our Bible, and we think we're getting the will of God, and we're getting confused. We're, we're following the will of the devil. 
where we can think that we feel the spirit, but it's where we feel a spirit, but we're not matching it up with what the word says, and we're again confused. circumstances. So what are what are providential circumstances? George is looking back. How could he look back? Because he recorded. Are we recording? Do we even know how we've been led in the past? Ellen White says we have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way that the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. Are we looking back to where we've come from? I think this is interesting because several times in my life I, I've hit questions it's like, have I been doing the right thing? Like, the path I've taken. But if, if you just record a little bit, which I have, and I look back at how I've been led like, here, here, and here, and here, I may not have followed God's will 100%, but you know what? He has opened doors for me. And because of that, I feel confident that maybe I should take the next step. We need to consider God's providence in our lives. So many times He has done something for us. So many times, but we just forget it. We've forgotten it. We don't know where we've come from, so how do we know where we're going? Step five. I ask God in prayer to reveal His will to me when right. He says that He would stay on His knees till He hears the voice of God. Like I said, we just had a whole, a whole lesson, a whole quarterly on prayer. We know what true prayer should look like, but are we starting to incorporate what we've learned? Are we just doing a one-way conversation, kneeling down, giving our petition, and then getting up and going, or are we waiting? Are we even expecting to hear something? Are we waiting to hear something, or is God just a one-way street? You just send the, the text message, and you'll never send a text message back. Psalms 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. So there must be time. Prayer, and it, the power of prayer, went through Ian Bounds, who writes that book, and I think with supplemental lesson great, he goes over and talks about people, great people of truth who prayed, and a lot of it was just them listening. They weren't talking. They were listening. Are we taking the time? Are we taking the time to listen? Now, this is a very good quote, especially for young people. But I think this can be this can be applied to anybody. Messages to young people, uh, page four sixty. If men and women are in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate marriage, they should pray four times a day when such a step is anticipated. Marriage is something that will influence and affect your life, both in this world and the world to come. How many of us really care to check in with what God thinks before we get married? I mean, it's what I think. Are we following these steps before we get married? Lord, I have no will in the matter. I can't say that I followed these steps 100% before I got married. Should we? I think we should. Is this just marriage? Or is this what should be my career in life? Is this what should be the next step in life? I've got my career, I'm in a comfortable place, what should I do next? Where should I move? You know, these are important questions. Are we putting the time in, the repetition in, the frequency in? What did uh, George Mueller say a few quotes ago? When he was certain on a matter, he would pray over and over and over and over again to make sure he got the same result. I don't know. If I get an answer, I think I'm done. The communication's over. We don't need to double check. Let's just go. But that's not the way to live our lives. Step six. You need to make your decision. You've prayed. So you've started with getting will of, getting rid of your own will. You've kicked out emotions. You've prayed to God. You've looked back at circumstances in the past where he's led you. Now it's time that you need to make your decision. He says that he comes to a deliberate judgment according to the best of his ability and knowledge. And if my mind is thus at peace and continues so after two or three more repetitions, 
So this is not the end. He does this, like I said, multiple times. Then he proceeds accordingly. George says that in trivial matters and in transactions involving the most important issues, I have found this method always effective. In another quote, he says that any time he followed these steps, same thing, in great transactions, small things, he never went astray. It is when he either listened to his own will or the will of those around him or the will of God that he has made the greatest errors. How do you think he can say this? Because he's recorded it. He's written it down. He knows where he's come from, and that's leading him to where he's going. He has, he has a spirituality, a Christianity that he has developed in, I could say, almost a scientific way. To where he knows that when he pre prays to God and with his communication, God will be listening and God will have an answer for him. James 1.6. Does anyone know what James 1.6 says? Let's turn there. Open your Bibles with me to James 1.6. And if someone can read it once they are there. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So once you make your decision... Don't flip. Here I like, do not have the paralysis of analysis. So many times you like to complicate. You're like, well, if I do this, and if I do that, and, and I decide, and they waver back and forth like a ship on the sea. No plan in life. Many times we hear God's will, but because of our unwavering and our inability to make a decision, we don't follow His will. I've heard it said that we should tell God our decision before we tell other people. Say, Lord, from what I understand, this is the way you would like me to go. I'm going to pursue in that direction. The next step, I'll give credit to Morris Benden. He's an Adventist mineral, a minister who, who has a similar sermon on this subject, uh, on George Mueller and the steps uh, to determining God's will. And he added step seven, which I think is very important. Ask God to stop me. So as you proceed with your decision, if it is not in, in, in line, aligned with the will of God, you need to be willing and you need to ask the Lord to stop you. And if you go to Revelation 3, 7, it's more of a prophetic verse, but it talks about doors being opened and doors being closed. Have you seen that in your life? Where you proceed in a certain direction, you think you're abiding by the will of God, but maybe a door will open over here, or maybe the door that you thought was his will will close. We need to be willing, for if in any manner we are confused or a little off, that we ask God to stop us and close doors and for us to respond appropriately. So what does that mean? That means that we could be applying for a job and doors are closing everywhere. Is that, is that something that you know, we should get discouraged from? Maybe, you know, with your career, doors are just closing, opportunities are falling apart. It could be that God is, is trying to lead you in a certain direction. He's closing other doors so He can open new ones for you. So we need to be willing to step out in faith and go through that new direction. Or accept that something has been closed before us. The greater the difficulty to be overcome, the more it will be seen how much can be accomplished by prayer and faith. When God overcomes our difficulties for us, we have the assurance that we are engaged in His work and not our own. I'm adding step eight because you cannot you cannot look back at the providential followings of God in the past if you haven't built monuments to Him today. If you're not recording your fifty thousand prayers that you've given to God. How will you know that he's ever answered your prayers? So I think it's critical for us in order to accept step four, consider providence, that we record how he has led us in the past. 
Additionally, we need to glorify the name of God. George said, I believe God has heard my prayers. He will make it manifest in his own good time that he has heard me. I have recorded my petitions that when God has answered them, his name will be glorified. He recorded them, and he glorifies the name of God. You can go, you can go to his museum, and you can see his, his, his uh, diaries, his records. Not only was he meticulous on the children, he was meticulous on ways that God has led him in the past. And he glorified God. In fact, it's interesting, when he was young and in Germany, he wanted to go travel the world. He wanted to be a missionary. But things didn't work out. Doors closed all around him. It was not until he became ill, moved to Bristol, England for health problems, and developed these orphanages that suddenly doors opened, and he traveled all over the world, traveled all over the United States, had, had sermons with Moody, Dwight L. Moody, and all these other people. It was only in God's time that some of these dreams had opened up for him. He glorified the name of God. Building monuments, 1 Samuel 7, 12 says, Then Samuel took the stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. Ebenezer, if you look up what Ebenezer means, it means stone of help. In Bible commentary, Page 1012, Alan White encourages, let such ones keep a diary, and when the Lord gives them an interesting experience, let them write it down, as Samuel did when the armies of Israel won, uh, armies of Israel won a victory over the Philistines. He set up a monument of thankfulness, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Brethren, where are the monuments by which you keep in view the love of and goodness of God, strive to keep afresh in your minds the help that the Lord has given you in your efforts to help others. You know, I, I remember hearing, um, I hear sometimes people say, you know, how come we don't have the miracles in this day and age that Jesus was doing in the past? You know, when he was there healing people, how come we don't have these miracles? We, we live in a world, we don't have them anymore. I think many times the reason is because we just don't record them. There are many miracles in our lives. Do we even remember them? Do we remember them? Do we write them down? God has led us before, and we have followed His will. Have we ever recorded how well it has gone for us? So does that mean you should put up a stone somewhere, an Ebenezer? It could. At the very least, it better be a diary. So very simple. In conclusion... Have no will of your own in the matter. Only seek to abide God's will. Do not rely on feelings and impressions, because we know how our feelings are. We wake up in the morning, and I just don't feel like it. I don't want to, oh, I just, I, can't, I don't feel like it. Study God's word. Are we spending time with the word of God? Are we asking for the Holy Spirit to guide us when we're spending time with the word of God? Or are we being guided by our own spirit that interprets the word the way we want it to be interpreted because we have our own will? <laughs> Consider providential circumstances. How has God led me in the past? Ask God in prayer. Directly talk to Him. And when you're talking to Him, you spend the time to listen for Him. Then you eventually have to make the decision. And then, as you proceed with the decision that you have made, based off of everything beforehand, you need to be willing and ask God to stop you if you are going in the incorrect direction. And then last but not least, build the monuments, because I really believe, you know, many times in our daily lives, we do not record this, we miss it, we forget how God has led us in the past, and then how are we able to ever fall back on the providential leadings of God in our if we have never marked it down. George is known to say, George Mueller, my Lord is not limited. He can supply, he can again supply. Those who decide to do nothing in any line that displeases God will know after presenting their case before him just what course to pursue. 
and they will receive not only wisdom, but strength. And, uh, but strength. Psy Rages 6, 68. They will know what path to pursue. And several other quotes that George said, many times after being on his knees, he knew what was the right way. He knew what the will of God would be. How do you know the will of God? You have to know God. You have to communicate with God. If we give up our own will, we can easily know. But I think we so often we complicate our lives. We make them worse. Those who in everything make God first and last and best are the happiest people in the world. Smiles and sunshine are not banished from their countenance. Thank you for your attention. My wish and prayer for all of us today is that we, we really develop our prayer life. I recommend that everyone goes to georgemuller.org, read a bit about his life. There's many pictures, there's many quotes. He's truly an inspiring man. I know he's not an SDA. He's not one of the founders of the SDA, but I do believe that we will see men like him in heaven. Men who had true walks of faith, who truly had a relationship with God. My wish and prayer for all of us is that we raise seven million dollars to do the will of God. Because we work day in, day out, making our 2.4 million. And there is no there is no end, there's no purpose, there's no point to it all. Our potential is limitless if we truly abide by the will of God in our lives.